Hey, well, hey there, everybody. I wanted to reach out and say hello from Chicago. I got in safely around two days ago. Let's see, it's Saturday night, so I got in Thursday night. Yeah, it's been two days. And um, the weather here's been a little bit chillier than what I was expecting in Memphis. I'm actually enjoying a fire and sitting and enjoying a crisp fall evening. Tomorrow morning, Sunday, we are going to go apple picking. It is the kickoff of honey crisp apple season up in Wisconsin, which is a big day, and they only have apple picking for the honey crisps for a few number of days up there. So we are going to go up there. It's my aunt's birthday, Aunt Dora's uh, birthday. So we're gonna go up there and we're gonna relive a family tradition of doing some apple picking. So I wanted to make sure that we had a good lesson and so I've been preparing and wanted to share that with you and record it and make it available on YouTube and through the Facebook Live so that you can participate this week in the Bible study. And what I wanted to talk to you this week, um, what I want to get into and study a little bit more is what we've been reading this week in Isaiah, specifically regarding Isaiah chapter 24 and some of the lead up to Isaiah 24 and some of the background going into Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24 is this amazing chapter in the book of Isaiah because it culminates and sort of the high point of what we're going to be looking at today is Isaiah 24 verses 23 and tw 21 through 23. Sorry. And Isaiah 24, 21 is in that day, which is going to be referring to the day of the Lord. And it says, in that day, the Lord will punish the gods in the heavens and the proud rulers of the nations of the earth. They will be rounded up and put in prison. They will be shut up in prison and will finally be punished. Then the glory of the moon will wane and the brightness of the sun will fade. For the Lord of heaven's armies will rule on Mount Zion. He will rule in great glory in Jerusalem, in the sight of all the leaders of his people. And so there it is, Jesus ruling in Jerusalem, the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. And so that is sort of the high point of Isaiah chapter 24. And it is something that is being built upon and built upon for many chapters. And this is something that we kind of read in Wednesday. And then when we got into Thursday, we actually got into the millennial reign of Christ. And we'll talk about that some more in the coming weeks. But I want to kind of discuss the material that we had this week, which is the judgment of the nations coming up into the rule of Christ and into his millennial rule. And so to get a kind of a context and an overview, you really want to be looking at chapters 13 through 23. Those are the chapters that kind of lead up to chapter 24. And in those chapters, it's showing the nations in rebellion. And you have all of these different nations that are in rebellion to the Lord. You have Babylon and Assyria, Philistines, Moab, Damascus, Samaria, Ethiopia, Egypt, Babylon, Edom, Arabia, Jerusalem, Tyre. He's going through all of the various nations and all of the rebellion that's going on across them. The only real break in this sort of judgment section that's going from chapters 13 to 23, and it's going, each one begins with a nation, and then it talks about how wicked they are and how they're going to be judged and how the Lord is going to discipline them. And it's interesting to see that he uses one nation to discipline another nation. He raises them up just like he rose up, and he used the Babylonians to capture Israel and bring them into captivity. And just like he has used nations throughout history, one will rise up, one will fall, and it has been something that the Jews in the Old Testament, they couldn't fathom that the Lord would use a wicked nation to judge what they viewed as his righteous people, this special possession. 
but yet ultimately they were not without sin. They had turned their backs from the Lord, and so he will use those that are wicked even so to discipline the ones that he loves in order to turn them back to him. And so we see this each nation being judged, each nation leading up to the day of the Lord and what's going on, how they rise, how they fall. And then we get in, there's only a brief break in chapter 19. We see in verses 24 and 25 that actually Egypt and Assyria are going to be blessed during the millennial reign along with Jerusalem, along with his chosen people. We see that even though they were in rebellion, eventually they are going to become and brought along and they are going to face blessing as well during the millennial reign. But other than sort of this brief little intercession, we have this period of just one after the other. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And it just kind of goes on and on. And then we have Isaiah 24 through 27. Um, we're going to talk about Isaiah 24 primarily today. And 24 through 27 is perhaps the greatest Old Testament section on the tribulation. Um, you know, it follows God's kingdom and then the apocalypse. It's sort of like the apocalypse according to Isaiah because we're going to see the millennial reign established. We're going to see what goes on in the millennial reign and we're going to see judgment and we're going to see all these things going on. And so this is a really amazing section of scripture and it ties in with so many other prophecies and it really ties in a lot with what Pastor Gaines has been teaching us in Revelation this year. And so there's so much going on that overlays one over the other and it's amazing to see how they line up and to see how Isaiah lines up with Revelation, to see how Isaiah lines up with the book of Zechariah, to see how he lines up with Matthew, to see how he lines up with these different sections of scripture with Micah. There's just all of these amazing tie-ins where you go, wow, I thought I read that somewhere else. And you did. The Lord is repeating himself through the Holy Spirit and giving us a knowledge and a glimpse into the future, into the day of the Lord. And as we read about the coming of the day of the Lord and the wickedness of the earth, it's amazing as we read what's going on in the world that you can see the end time events beginning to unfold. And you see things that are coming together. You know, Israel has its land. Israel has been restored. The Jews around the world every year are coming home, just as it refers to in Isaiah. You see more and more Jews in Europe are feeling less and less welcome. And the number of Jewish people making Aliyah to the nation of Israel climbs every single year. And there's a lot of folks coming. And it's a time where a lot of people who are Jewish in background are feeling called to return to the land of Israel. They're feeling less secure in the places they had lived. And this is something that is referred to in the book of Isaiah. And so we're seeing these prophecies coming together. And that's a really interesting thing to think about in this new year. Today at sundown, it ended, was Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. It's the celebration. It's the year 5781. So if you're counting biblically back to the Garden of Eden, you would, this would be the year 5781 according to the Jewish calendar after the day of creation. And so Jews all around the world last night, they began to celebrate. They blew the ram's horn and they would wish people to Shana Tova, which is to have a good new year and may your name be written in the book of life. And traditionally they would celebrate by eating apples and honey together. May this new year be sweet as apples and sweet as honey and may you be written in the book of life. And so it's just this really festive time that's coming up and it's something to be thinking about. And right now there is a, you know, it's a good time for Israel. It's a time of safety and peace that they haven't really seen. Peace deals have just been reached with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. You know, this is the first time that there's been any real significant movement for Israel with its neighbors in a really long time. And so right now, things are going well for the nation of Israel. It is more secure in its borders than it really ever has been at any point in the last 50 years. Things are really stable. Things are really safe. Iran is an enemy that not only Israel recognizes, but a lot of the other Arab nations view it as a threat. And they're looking at Israel as a partner to help contain Iran. And so they found themselves in a position where they have a lot more peace and security than they've had in a long time. 
And that's a really great thing, but it's also making it a time where there's a lot of Jewish folks around the world that feel safe about returning to Israel and visiting Israel. And that's a real blessing. And we see this sort of coming together, this strengthening of Israel. And that's something that Isaiah foretold thousands of years ago. And it's great to be able to see that this is coming together. And it's just a wonderful thing. And so Isaiah 24 opens up in verse 1. And we see here it says, Look, the Lord is about to destroy the earth and make it a vast wasteland. He devastates the surface of the earth and scatters the people, priests and lay people, servants and masters, maids and mistresses, buyers and sellers, lenders and borrowers, bankers and debtors, none will be spared. The earth will be completely emptied and looted. The Lord has spoken. The earth mourns and dries up, but in the land wastes away and withers. Even the greatest people on the earth waste away. The earth suffers for the sins of its people, and they have twisted God's instructions, violated his laws, and broken his everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must pay the price for their sin. They are destroyed by fire, and only a few are left alive. So we have a global judgment that begins in Isaiah 24, and we see verse 1 through 6. There's a global judgment. Nothing escapes. The earth is the primary subject. We see the word earth used seven times in the first six verses of Isaiah 24. And so it's not just the people of the earth that are suffering during this judgment, but it's the earth itself. The earth is emptied, it's looted, it's worn, it dries up, the land wastes away. And why? Isaiah tells us in verse 5, The earth suffers for the sins of its people, for they have twisted God's instructions, violated his laws, and broken his everlasting covenant. And so we see that the earth is suffering because man has broken the covenant. Now, it's not real clear here whether it's referring to the covenant with Adam or the covenant with Noah, but in the end, the man, mankind, we have broken the covenant of the Lord. The earth is suffering for that, and it's not just a specific group of people. We see here that Isaiah contrasts priests and lay people, the holy and the regular, servants and masters, the rich and the poor, maids and mistresses, buyers and sellers, lenders and borrowers, bankers and debtors, none will be spared. So it's the great and the small. It's the powerful and the weak. It's the holy, you know, it's those that are called to serve the Lord that are the priests and not just them, but the regular people. So it's really everybody on the face of the earth is facing this punishment, this wrath for what has gone on. And what is going on in the earth. So there's this whole period of suffering that's about to begin. And nobody is spared. Um, except for a small remnant that we're going to read about. And we see why it's because of man. And so then it goes on in Isaiah chapter 7. Or sorry, Isaiah 24 verse 7 through 20. And what we're seeing here is sort of this poetic and sort of just more long and drawn out version describing the suffering that's going on. And so we see in verses 7 through 9 that wine and song are gone. There's no more joy. There's no more celebration. Times are so bad that there is no new wine. There's nothing to drink. There's nothing to celebrate. There's no merrymaking. There's no cheer. There's no music. There's no tambourines. There's no celebration. It's all gone. The earth is just sort of become a wasteland. It's barren. People are dead. People are dying. They're hungry. And there's really no cause for celebration at this point in history. It's just a terrible, terrible time to be alive. We see that right before the millennial reign of Christ, that things are really awful on the face of the earth. That in the days before Jesus returns, in the days before Messiah steps foot on the Mount of Olives, that the times leading up to this are just really awful and really full of suffering. Really just a terrible time to be on the earth. And just something like has never been seen in the days of man before. And so it goes on that 
in the that the suffering continues and we see that there's really only a small remnant that's spared verses 14 through 16 tell us but all who are left shout and sing for joy those in the west praise the lord's majesty but it's not many verse 13 tells us that there's only a remnant left so the ones that are left are these faithful believers in the Lord, and they shout and they sing and they praise. And it says in verse 16, we hear songs of praise from the ends of the earth, songs that give glory to the righteous one. But it's this tiny, tiny fraction of the earth that is left to praise and to give worship to the Lord. We see that overall there has just been decimation, only a remnant is left. The Lord refers to it through Isaiah like stray olives left on a tree or the few grapes left on the vine after the harvest. So not very much, just a little handful at like a picked over grove where there's just a handful to be found but really nothing substantial. Only a remnant is left. And so this is really the climax of the last 10 chapters of Isaiah. Like I said, in, verse, in chapters 13 through 23, we've been reading about the destruction of all these nations, all of these different nations from Babylon through all the way to Tyre. And we've been seeing their destruction. We've been seeing what the Lord's going to do to them. And it really culminates in this section of Isaiah in, verse, in chapter 24 where we see this destruction. And then it begins in verse 21. Isaiah writes, in that day. And what day is he referring to? He's referring to the period of time known as the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, it's important for us to remember that day here does not mean a literal 24-hour day. But this is a period of time. The day of the Lord is this period of time that is going to go by. And so it says, in that day, in that era, in that time, in the day of the Lord, now we are going to see the judgment of the Lord executed, the punishment, the coming, the rain. We are going to see the Lord basically beginning the process of settling the accounts, beginning the process of punishing the wicked, beginning the process of executing that which he promised to do in the beginning when he establishes the reign of Christ, the reign of Messiah, and the ushering in of this era of peace, of prosperity, where there is going to be no more death. And it begins with this verse. And the Lord says, In that day the Lord will punish the gods in the heavens and the proud rulers of the nations of the earth. Okay, so the first thing we see here is the judgment of God's enemies in verse 21. We're going to see three specific kind of realities going on in verses 21 through 23. We're going to see this judgment in verse 21 that's spiritual and human. Then we're going to see in verse 22 that the judgment is two parts. And then in verse 23, we're going to see the reign of Messiah, the reign of Yeshua, the reign of Jesus. And so in verse 21, we see the judgment of God's enemies. We see here that in that day the Lord will punish. So the host of heaven on high um, is going to punish the fallen angels and Satan. And he's also going to punish the kings of the earth, the human kings that have stood against him, the proud rulers. Psalm 2, 2 talks about the kings of the earth taking their stand against the Lord. Revelation 19, 11 through 15 talks about the kings of the earth and their armies gathering together to wage war against the rider on the horse, to wage war against Jesus. And so here we see Isaiah's description of that event that is detailed in other sections of scripture. And you see it from these different perspectives, these different visual eyes, as it will, just like if you were to interview different witnesses that see one event, depending on what corner they were standing on, what angle they have, they're all going to have a slightly different take of what was going on. And so Isaiah talks about it, and he sees that the proud rulers of the nations of the earth, 
They're going to be rounded up and put into prison. The Lord is going to punish these wicked people. And so we see that here it's not just the rulers on the earth. It's not just human rulers, but it's spiritual as well. It's going to be these, you know, the gods in heavens. And that is going to be the fallen angels and Satan. Revelation 21 through 3 talks of the binding of Satan for a thousand years in the abyss. And Isaiah 24, the tribulation lines up with Revelation 6 through 19, where he talks about the judgment of the wicked rulers. In Revelation 19, 19 through 20 and 21 through 3, there is such tremendous mirroring of what's going on here in the book of Isaiah. We see here that in, and just so I want to kind of, there are a couple of them that really overlap, and it's good to take a look and see because Isaiah and Revelation here really line up. So in Isaiah 21, it says that he is going to punish the host of heaven above. And then we see in Revelation 20 verse 2, he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan. So we see that this reference back and forth. And then in verse 21, he goes on, it says, the kings of the earth below. And then in Revelation 19, 19, it says, the kings of the earth and their armies. And then in Isaiah, Isaiah writes, confined to a dungeon or a prison. And then in Revelation 19, it says that they threw him into the abyss, closed it, and put a seal on it. And then in Isaiah 24, 22, it says, after many days... And in Revelation 20, we get until the thousand years were completed. So the many days that Isaiah refers to is most likely this thousand year period where Satan was bound or is going to be bound. That that's what that many days period means in the book of Isaiah. That that is sort of clarified when John writes in the book of Revelation. And then after many days, they will be punished. Whereas John writes in Revelation 20, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur. Revelation 27 and Revelation 2010. And so we see this unbelievable overlap between the book of Isaiah in 24 and the book of Revelation in 19 and 20. Okay, so now we're getting into the two stages of the judgment. First, like we talked about, there's been confinement. They're going to be shut up in a prison, confined to a dungeon in the New American. And then there's going to be many days. So we're going to see an initial confinement period. And then there's going to be the final judgment. And we see this in Revelation that there is the second death. There is the final judgment, the white throne. We see that there is this period where there is punishment that follows confinement. And so there's the final judgment. And this gap here that is not explicit in Isaiah is really fleshed out in Revelation as being the thousand years. And that really overlays quite nicely and seems to match up and would make sense that that's what Isaiah is referring to. And then finally... After this thousand years, after this binding of Satan and then this thousand year period and then this point where they are finally punished and done with, then we see Isaiah 23 and it reads, then, then, so after this final punishment, after this throwing in, then the glory of the moon will wane and the brightness of the sun will fade for the Lord of heaven's armies will rule on Mount Zion. He will rule in great glory in Jerusalem in the sight of all the leaders of his people. So then we have the Messiah's return and kingdom. And so there we're going to have, so we're going to have this thousand years and we're going to have the Messiah's return in his kingdom. And it's something that we see in Zechariah 14 that his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives and will be king over all the earth. In Matthew 24, Jesus said the moon will be darkened and the sun will not shed its light. In Revelation 6, we see the sixth seal being broken, the earthquake, 
the sun becoming black and the moon becoming like blood. In Isaiah 24, 23, the glory of the moon will wane and the brightness of the sun will, sorry, the glory of the moon will wane and the brightness of the sun will fade. And so we're seeing here that this vision of the future where we're going to see that it is going to, because we're not going to need the sun, we're not going to need the moon because God himself, Messiah, will be the light. And we see the beginning of this great glory. And he will rule in great glory in Jerusalem. So there's going to be a battle on earth, and then there's going to be a kingdom on earth. And, you know, this, this reference here is to the Lord of the armies of heaven, the Lord of hosts. In Hebrew, it's Yahweh to Saba. And so it's this interesting term where we see that the Lord is the Lord of heaven's armies. So he's ruling over the earth, and he's ruling over over the heavens. He's king of both, king of the universe and king of Jerusalem. Isaiah 9, he talks about this child and the government being upon his shoulders on the throne of David. Isaiah 11 talks about the shoot and the stump of Jesse reigning over the earth. And so we see this ruling and reigning from Mount Zion in Jerusalem that's both this spiritual and this earthly physical reign. Micah 4, talks about the mountain of the Lord and Zion will go forth the law. In Isaiah 2, 2, it's nearly identical, talking about the mountain of the Lord and the people going up and from the mountain, the Lord will rule and the law will go forward and there is going to be peace on the earth. And thus begins this messianic reign. And as we get into chapter 25, we're going to see that there's this wonderful banquet feast and there's going to be meat and wine and there's going to be this wonderful feast and death is going to be swallowed up forever to be forgotten and there's going to be no more death and no more devastation and it's going to be this time where we are together with Messiah and we are praising him and we are enjoying time with him and the sovereign Lord wipes away all tears. He removes forever all insults and mockery against his land and people. For the Lord has spoken, in that day the people will proclaim, This is our God, we trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. So in that day, in that day is the kickoff of the millennial reign of Christ. And so after reading these chapters of Isaiah where we have read the indictment, of the nation of Israel in the beginning and what they have done wrong and then the indictment of all the other nations of the earth and what they have done wrong and we see the Lord listing out how he is going to punish them through Isaiah's prophecies and then we get into Isaiah 24 where we see this culmination in the day of the Lord and the messianic reign that begins and so we see this ushering in of this thousand year reign of Messiah that comes and, and we see it being fleshed out in Isaiah 24. And then we get into Isaiah 25, 26, 27. And we see this millennial reign of Christ. And it's this really fantastic glimpse into the wonderful future that we have promised to us as believers. That we have the assurance of in, in, in Yeshua, in Messiah, in his assurance to know that through his perfect sacrifice, we are going to be able to have a relationship with the Lord and a seat at the banquet supper of the Lamb, to be able to feast, to be able to be there with the Lord. We are forever absolved of the worry of death, where we are free of fear, where we will have no more tears. And Isaiah begins to describe it with fabulous spiritual vision that gets fleshed out in other verses and other sections of scripture. But Isaiah lays this prophetic foundation stone that is sort of the, the foundation of this messianic prophecy that will be built upon in other prophets and then again in Revelation. And we see how in the end times things will come together. And so it's going to be just an absolutely wonderful time once the tribulation and that terrible era is over to be able to spend time with Messiah Jesus and just to be able to read about it and see what the promise is for the future.
to know that we have a hope, that we have a promise of days ahead that are going to be full of joy and peace and prosperity beyond anything that we could ask, hope for, or imagine. And it's just going to be a great time. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for sending Messiah Jesus to us. Thank you for giving us your Son, for his willingness to come to this earth, to suffer and to die and to be a perfect sacrifice for us, Lord, so that we could have the assurance of salvation in you. And Almighty Father, thank you that he was raised from the dead and that he rules and reigns in heaven and that he is returning one day to step foot on the Mount of Olives and to strike down the enemies of the Lord and to establish his thousand-year reign, the millennial reign of Messiah in Jerusalem. Lord, thank you that he is going to come and establish that and then one day that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and that we are going to be able to spend an eternity with you, Father. And Almighty God, I just praise you and I thank you for your Son, Jesus. And I thank you for the word of the Lord, which stands now true forever and ever, and speaks and lives, and gives us a hope and an assurance of things yet to come. In the matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, thank you guys for tuning in, and I hope you have a great week. And um, I look forward to seeing everybody when I get back from Chicago. So uh, stay warm down there in Memphis. And uh, if need be, curl up by a fire.